Good afternoon, everyone. I'm um, very pleased to see you. I want us to start. So we've been here for a week. I know it's the end of the week and we are all very tired. We have been to different kinds of sessions. We've attended very high level sessions where ministers and presidents have spoken. We've attended sessions where we've heard from the indigenous communities. We've heard from the youth that just, that just left the stage. But we decided we want a, a session that speaks to pastoralists. We want to hear the voices of the people who live in the drylands. So I want to, this session will get us to that point. Um, and we are going to start with a story. It's a story about the people who live in the dryland areas and the ways in which they deal with climate and environmental shocks. I hope that by the end of this 20 to 30 minute session, you really learn to appreciate what the communities in these areas bring to the table and to this debate of climate adaptation. So this story starts at a place where a passenger climbs down from a bus into a marketplace in Moyale. If you don't know where Moyale is, it's in one of those, it's, it's in Northern Kenya. So um, this is Tahira. Tahira is from Marsabit and she has spent her years in the UK doing a, her PhD, her postdoctoral thesis on researching the pastoral communities and trying to understand how they really build their resilience. How are they coping? What do they do when they face this climate, um, situ um, climate um, change situations in their own communities? So she spent her time at the UK and she's coming back home and she's in the bus stop. So we meet in, in the market. Tahira, welcome. Thank you very much, Cynthia, for that introduction. Thank you for joining us, uh, dear audience. Um, I'm going to, I just passed the Siolo. I'm now going to Moyale. Moyale is a uh, border town to Ethiopia, and that's where I was born, and that's where I, I lived and schooled. So um, I'm actually catching my bus, but then before that, let me pass by market in Marsebet and get some information about the situation and how pastoral is dealt with drought. But as she was walking in the market to look for information, she sees her friend Shoba. Enter Shoba. Oh, okay. Now, I was just saying hi, Shoba, in our mother tongue, uh, because we couldn't, uh, like, avoid that. Like, automatically, you see a pastoralist, you want to be, to be home. So, uh... Shoba, I'm glad to see you. Uh, I'm going home to see my family. I haven't seen them uh, for quite some time. So before that, let me just take some intelligence from you. How are the things? How did you respond to the recent drought? Okay, it was uh, very bad. Uh, it was tough. But we continue uh, with the response. Yeah. How? Wh were you able to move your heart in a safe place? Like, what did you do? Okay, we acted. Uh, very fast uh, after we got a uh, warning and prediction uh, from our uh, leaders, okay, from the traditional forecast and also the government uh, a lot. So uh, we were fortunate to sell our animals, some of it, uh, and we also got a good uh, price for those animals, but we could not dispose all of it and we decided to look for a place where we can take those animals and uh, we manage through our friends, through our relatives, some places we have to hire. Of course, as we moved, others also moved, and our leaders or our elders helped us uh, because as uh, pastoralists converge in a place, there are normally a lot of competition and conflict will normally uh, be there. So our leaders, our elders uh, helped us in uh, mobilizing and also agreeing uh, that uh, in case there'll be conflict, uh, it should be stopped. And that is how, how we were able to manage the crisis. And we also had opportunity uh, with the government uh, through cash transfer 
uh, the cash transfer was given to the vulnerable pastoralists and also we got uh, support from humanitarian organization on the same to cushion on our essential uh, as uh, we got all this through it was through uh, mobilization uh, security provision of security mobilization for the safe passage of our animals and also the, uh, the, the cash transfer. But I want to confirm to you that uh, it was not easy. The pastoralists suffered a lot. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, that's really hard. Uh, in summary, like responding included early action. You had to move your animals through even using technologies. And also you had to have elders negotiate in accessing in some insecure places. So that is commendable, but hard time it takes. But that there is a big challenge now. Uh, with the family, but, uh, um. <coughs> Can you hear? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I heard from uh, from Diba that there is now people are moving from response to recovery. Could you tell me how you are recovering? Okay. Uh, recovery is what we are trying, but uh, what we are saying is, uh, especially with the pastoralist, uh, the drought has always been there, but now it is frequently coming and it is uh, uh, dis distorting the way of life. But uh, we lost a lot of animals and especially the cows, and uh, because we have seen uh, we observed through, through this, this drought that uh, some species, some, uh, some type of uh, cows or breeds do very well. So our intention is to improve on that so that we can't replace, of course, our animals because that is our way of life and that is our, how, how we can get our food. But we intend to replace some of the breed that uh, are not uh, resistant to the drought and heat uh, with the ones that are able to uh, resist the drought and also the heat. Uh, again, uh, we have a way of supporting each other because communities most of the time do, do have the way of uh, restocking each other. And this is through something we call in our community called uh, Dabare. Dabare is sharing of your livestock with the, with the people who lost. Uh, I know not many people le were left with many cattle, but uh, that said, still community or relatives will support each other with uh, animals uh, to, to cushion what they have gone through. So this is one way of doing it. And then some of the pastoralists also have now embraced the idea of insurance. And that insurance is also cushioning the pastoralists. But still, I want to confirm the problem is still there. We need to work on the attitude of our community to improve and have uh, diversification of livelihood, not to, not to replace uh, our, our way of life because that is what the area will provide, but how do we diversify our pastoral livelihood? Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Shoba. That's that's commendable. I passed by my sister-in-law in Isiolo, and she gave me camel milk. Why can't we share a little bit? This is the spirit of pastoralism. Thank you. We are feeding the, thank you. the nation, but we are also uh, living with cli climate crisis, and also we, and uh, we are only recognized. Uh, our our efforts are, are not recognized so much. So. <laughs> yeah, this camel milk is done by women enterprise which is located in Solo. It's so delicious. So um, scientists are predicting that there will be Lenina soon. Like uh, I hope uh, pastoralists are prepared for that. Of course nobody will be prepared for Lenina or even for that matter any any climate shock. But uh, we'll be preparing ourselves and I've also heard it is coming. And we pray to God that it will, it will not take all of our hearts. Oh, thank you so much. I, I, I'm seeing.
seeing uh, I'm seeing uh, a famous Dr. Guyo who has been on TV, on CNN, talking about pastoralism and resilience. Let me catch up with him before I take my bus to Mwele. Hi, uh, salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam, Guyo. Come, come, come. Lato. Nagene balada. Nagene. Orina, come. Orada. Nka, naka, misa, waka, tu. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We're just greeting. Uh, Dr. Roba, we've been talking about how pastoralists have been responding to recent uh, drought and we also spoke about how they are in the recovery process. Uh, I know you've been at uh, this Africa Climate Summit uh, for the past week. Could you please tell us like, maybe what you want us to know regarding this matter? Okay, thank you. I think Climate Summit is about talking. <laughs> so we talked about resilience, which is basically uh, discussing capacity of communities to prepare for the next shock an ability to anticipate shock and uh, respond actually better and be get better prepared. Oh, I see. Like in terms of resilience, what what is important for pastoralists? Like what action do they take? Yeah, I think resilience. People already are doing a lot. If you look around, I think uh, pastoralists through they are changing the hard portfolio, having more sheep and goat than than camel. Uh, sorry, there are cows because cows and sheep are most affected by drought. So people are moving slightly, even the predominantly cattle keeping community like mine, the Borana, are now embracing camel and, and, and partly sheep. And it's part of the portfolio diversification. Of course, we are also seeing a lot of things happening in town where people are taking up new livelihood styles, uh, new livelihood strategy, uh, going into casual labor, going into small business going into fishing for communities like Turkana, which are the show of Lake Turkana. Uh, and of course, other options, embracing you know agriculture and many things. So we already, I think people are in, in their own way, doing a lot in terms of uh, you know being resilient, uh, you know, to, to prepare for shocks and, and face the next shocks. Oh, thank you so much. I, I, I'm happy to know all that. But from my own experience, including even my, my PhD, one thing which is so close to me is how pastoralists uh, uh, invest in solidarities and relationships to, for them to, to prosper in building their resilience, but also in responding. As my sister Shoba mentioned, uh, pastoralists actually transfer livestock. They can transfer temporary livestock so that at least you can overcome the shortages that you have, but they can also transfer permanent livestock. And in all this transfer, relationships based on uh, let's say clanship or even neighborliness or even relationship because of being in tamarity in, 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 in living in the same place is very important and this relationship helps people to to be resilient because for you to get access to secure places you have to have a good relationship with your neighbors even if you are enemy in a sense in, in essence that enmity will go because you need to survive and you can cross that border. So I think that aspect of solidarity is very important and it has been really useful for pastoralists. Yeah, I think where I come from, we say life is shared and communal. So nobody has an entire sole responsibility for your own life. So because of that relationship uh, of late, I think because of the climate change, uh, capacity becomes very important. And when you say capacity, ability of communities to, to visualize risk, ability of communities to see that. And when you look around, of course, you will also see communities engaged in different things. Personally, actually, in my work in Isiolo, a lot of work we did around mapping community, uh, you know, doing the um, range and mapping, and uh, what we call hard as mental map. So people understand the risk, understand, they interpret their landscape very well, and also see point of vulnerability. So what we usually do, I think, one of the capacity elements is to help communities project that mapping and uh, position them better in terms of capacity to foresee risk, to map risk, and also align resources. If they are the center of this capacity, I think the participation becomes very important. And when you participate, you have on the process. And that is the most important thing. When you have on the process, you can shape investment, you can shape policies. And this is already happening, you know, within the areas where we work. I've been in that business for quite a long time. And it's quite good. I think government also has to take cognizance of that and see how do you tap into this already, you know, started journey and opportunities to help people now own the visualization of risk, position them and use their landscape to see this risk and also see how you align infrastructure and any other thing people call, you know, climate resilient infrastructure to these, uh, you know, uh, emerging uh, risks.
Oh, that's very useful. I'm seeing my bus is approaching, but before I leave, I want to emphasize one thing about rela relationships. Pastoralists actually build relationship even with, uh, like for example, in Northern Kenya, we have uh, expansion of mobile technology, use of mobile technology. They establish a relationship with M-Pesa. M-Pesa is uh, where money is transferred through mobile money. You can establish a relationship with M-Pesa agent who can supply you when you need when you are in need of cash. They can establish a relationship with the uh, agrovets, those people who sell veterinary medicine. All this relationship will provide you medicine and cash on loan so that you can repay when you, re when you are in the reco recovery uh, mode. So I hope we will invest on those relationships relationships and the capacities that pastoralists already have. I'll see you. Bye. Okay, inshallah. See you. Now I'm actually seeing my elder, one of my elder in my village. Tumal. We've been in Isiolo together. We had a conversation. We had dialogue. You talked about your own experience in last drought. And I think I want you to shed a bit of light on what are you doing now to prepare yourself for the next shock. What are the key things are you doing now so that the next shock is not as bad as Akbarim Hunga Kagadovu, Akbar Dabrentan? Thank you. In the first place, my name is Tumal Orto. I'm a livestock keeper of camels, goats, and sheep. Uh, I'm not a livestock keeper of today or yesterday. I come from a family of who are keeping camels since 1750. So, okay, we have passed, okay, 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023, up to March, April, we had a very serious experience. We learned a lot. I'm not going to talk about the postmortem, I've lost this much, and so forth. But now, it's also, since climate has been with the, uh, climate has been with uh, pastoral communities for many years. But those days, they say climate is our friend. They used to plan on this, just answering your question, on two issues. The time of plenty and the time of scarcity. When I have the plenty, how will I prepare myself for the time of scarcity? It's, it's symbiotic relationship. But climate has shifted that and we have learned a lot. Now, I am now at my individual level, I am now preparing myself. Uh, the number of camels that I remain with, the number of the camel, uh, goats and sheep that I am remain with, I am getting what we call dime two. That is information. Bush telegrams, you see, where there's no mobiles and so forth. People are getting information at the water point and so forth. And that's what we call it dime two or bush telegrams, which moves with the camels. You see camels move many kilometers. So, as we now hearing about the Illinois, the first thing is that I moved my camels to higher ground right now, a place called Iole, which is, uh, I think my brother there knows it. It's a highland with less mosquitoes and so forth. And good enough, last night, there was a rain in the middle of Chalbi Desert. Today, my camels enjoying a water. I just moved one week ago. But also, when we are doing that, it's not only the conventional uh, information sharing, we are also, we have got intestine readers, uh, I mean, in the, about the stars and so forth, animal body uh, languages and so forth. I'm only remaining with the ghosts to move them, but they are giving birth now. So, uh, okay, then the other important thing is there's a checklist. Now, if a lino comes, it comes with what now? You have to do the warming your animals, you have to weekly spraying so that you reduce the number of uh, I mean mosquito bites to keep them at bay and also the, even recently there was a vaccination going on uh, I mean uh, that is PPP and uh, PPR which is very common these days and comes with so uh, I'm just saying uh, I've done my checklist it's long and say and, uh, and by doing so, you are reducing the vulnerability. I mean, you are reducing, you are reducing and improving the health of your animals. Thank you, thank you, thank you, my Hollywood actors. As you can see, they have, I hope we've learned something that communities have strategies. Communities are the first respondents. 
and they are anticipating they are acting they are, they are, they are, and they are planning how to recover and to build their own resilience. Two Miles examples, the elder, the ladies examples, you've heard them. And I think for me, and I hope for all of you, some key takeaways is that communities have essential knowledge that we must use up, like we must take advantage of. Um, we, the anticipation is the name of the game. Actions must be triggered at the right time with the right people based on the right local and scientific intelligence so it's not only scientific it's only not only the research the locals have told us they know what to do and it has kept them going while we are, before we even get there and also another point we've heard is that immediate response are always essential but we must look at the long-term resilience how do we build the long-term resilience and finally i think Dr. Guyo has told us very well, invest in the capacities of your local, your first respondents, the communities. They are the ones who act the first. So we need to really build their capacities. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to our short narration.